Hi everyone, welcome to Talks at Google. Today it is my pleasure to welcome Jeremy Saunier and Anton Yelchin for our green room. Let's give a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Um, could you give us a brief overview of what the film's about? Sure. It is a punk rock siege thriller. It is set in the uh, backstage green room of a uh, concert venue during a live concert. And basically, an out-of-town band has witnessed the aftermath of a backstage murder. And the club happens to be run by Nazi skinheads. And so they barricade themselves in and try and survive the night. It's a good summary. Um, uh, so this is, I mean, it's, it's a very claustrophobic siege film. Um, you know, it's, it's very sort of limited in the, the scope of where you, was that always the intention with it or did you ever, were you tempted to go outside the club with it? Um, oh, I wanted to. <laughs> I wanted to, but no, I mean, the scenario demanded that we, we stay in that pressure cooker scenario. Um, my first film, Murder Party, actually takes place in a enclosed, actually it's a Brooklyn warehouse and it's a it's an it's a macabre art party gone wrong and it's similar in tone as far as like an overnight sort of blood fest but that's more of a gonzo horror comedy the the key there is when you're an independent filmmaker you're told you know do something in a single location it'll be cheaper um, it's just people talking in a room and, and for me you know my attraction towards cinema is is visual, and so I, I found that very uh, suppressive. I was just, I was just like, this is terrible. All I do is listen to people talk. It's not my thing. Um, so my next film, I, I got out in the open road and explored highways and forests and got a lot of production value of that. And then for Green Room, just the scenario demanded that I promised I'd never go back into that sort of scenario, but I did. But this time, I had, I knew what I was getting into. So I think we achieved a certain level of craft. Yeah. Um, you said you said your attraction to film is visual, and this is one of your first movies that you aren't the cinematographer on. Correct. Um, what was it like, sort of taking, not necessarily a step back, because obviously you're going to be very involved in the visual aesthetic of it. But what was that experience like? Well, that was a big thing. Is that knowing going in that this is an ensemble performance piece, and there's pit bulls and shotguns and gunfights and mayhem all throughout the film. That my attention had to be elsewhere. If I if I was looking through the eyepiece of the camera and I had to get this tunnel vision. Now with Blue Ruin, it was very quiet and almost wordless for most of the film. Green Room is just nonstop, like throttling, and the, the emotional charge of the characters had to be really accounted for. And, and I, I leaned heavily on Anton and the whole cast for that. Um, but I, I definitely had to oversee many departments, and, and having a cinematographer was actually a great weight off my shoulders. So, Anton, how did you get involved in the project? Uh, in a pretty, pretty standard way. I, I think I just I, I got the script and I read it and I skyped with Jeremy and uh, I then ended up meeting with him a little later, actually a little bit later, actually. And then, uh, yeah, pretty, pretty standard trajectory, honestly. Uh, not nothing too exciting to relay here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> She'd be like, oh. I found the script yeah. in the street. Yeah, I found the yeah. script in the street that I read through a maze. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's awesome. Jeremy was waiting on the other side. <laughs> With a machete. With a machete. I was going to say a sword, but <laughs> yeah. a machete. Yeah. That's a mask. Green room too, then? <laughs> yeah. On a dragon. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you, but, but you also have experience, and like punk has been an influence on your lives. Um, yeah. Did that? Did you know that about Anton when you cast him? Or I mean, look at us. No, <laughs> no one would think that. But no, I have I have a history, and so does he. And Anton would love to tell you about his band. Jeremy. Okay, so my <laughs> band name. It was with my best buddies. So like, I love those guys. So I've relayed to them over the years many times my dissatisfaction with the name. <laughs> But that being said, I had this band and we had a great time just being a really shitty punk band. And we played a lot of gigs like the one in the, in the film where uh, you play to six people. Um, uh, and ironically, I found out we're doing our press day at the Viper Room tomorrow in LA. And that's where we would play Sundays at midnight. So Sundays at midnight, that's not like peak hour for a show, you know? <laughs> Uh, but we, we, we had such a good time, and, and I think when I met Jeremy, um, obviously it wasn't about, like, I'd, yeah, I'd been in a band, but it's about other things when you're signing on for a film, I think. But 
the feeling that you have playing with your friends, your best friends, and sharing those times, like if you're going, you know, on the road to play, or you're just playing, just bonding over playing for six people and all of you feeling so low that the six people haven't clapped once um, is the best feeling in a way because only you and your friends share that and that's kind of for me what was so touching about this film is like Pat and his friends are all put in jeopardy but for Pat he's seeing the fact that his be best friends are in jeopardy and that to me was kind of the the heart and soul of the piece, but like really what's touching that you experience when you're playing with your friends, you know? Uh, speaking of your friends, there's also, uh, this is actually a character that we meet that isn't a member of the band, is, is Imogen Boots' character, right. who's this, we don't know who or what she is, and... Yes, she emerges from the shadows. Yeah, and we don't find out a lot about her even through the course of the film. Um, could you talk about her sort of evolution? I feel like she's like a hero at the end of it. Yeah, um, I mean, it was really important for me to have a strong female character, and I like, I like playing with the fact that she starts as the girlfriend of the victim, you know? And she's trapped in the room with this band, and then she, we didn't even give her close-ups. Imogen Poots, yeah, whatever, you're, you're in the background. We cut off her frame, you know, she'd be out of half out of frame. We kind of disregard her as a character. But she kind of earns her way into the inner circle, and it's really fun to see that dynamic happen where, you know, not to give any spoilers away, but she does emerge as a central character, and she pretty much takes over and kicks ass. And you've worked with her before on Fright Night, right? Uh, yeah, sorry, I was just like trying it's, to negotiate all this while Jeremy was, was speaking. So many layers. It was you. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I was so happy to be able to work with Emmy again. I have so much respect for her and so inspired by her. Um, and uh, the great thing is, is, is our work in Fright Night has literally nothing to do with this film. I mean, they're just like totally different characters in a totally different film. And I was just happy to be on set with her again. It's always nice to see your friends uh, at Murdered. work. Murdered. Murdered. <laughs> Murdered. <laughs> That's the kind of guy I am. What can I say? That's why I was cast in this film. My bloodlust. <laughs> Cold-hearted willingness to throw your friends to murder. So are we ever going to see a film from you where somebody doesn't get murdered or stabbed? Or you know, if you, like... if you dig deep, there's. Uh, I, I kind of found my my way doing these genre films, but um, I have a short film, 2004. It's called Crab Walk. It's a melancholy comedy. Who would have thought? Um, and yes, I will eventually explore a lower body count, <laughs> but, but I think I'm actually getting these in before I get too soft. I'm a, I'm a father of three, I have, very, I'm, I have a very fulfilling life at home, surrounded by love, but these are the films that I loved growing up, and I'm trying to maintain that connection long enough to, 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 to do them myself before I become one of those guys that makes, I don't know, animated films for my kids. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> I know. I know. Um, there's actually, there is a lot of sort of violence and viscera, but it, it didn't feel gratuitous, which I, is a, I mean, that is a compliment. Like, it was like, yeah, this is necessary because this is the situation. Yeah. Um, how did you negotiate <coughs> that kind of fine line between, like, oh, this is a slasher, gross, horror, horror film, and, like, this is horrifying? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's ratchet up intensity, and, and all the violence has a, a very articulate purpose within the movie. Um, and sometimes it is like full frontal gore, and it's to rub your face in it. I mean, there's, a, there's a transition in the film, one of the key characters, where she becomes a killer, and she, it's reluctant. It's not like, again, there's no bloodlust here. This is like a very, this is a war movie. There's, there's two sides, one very um, singular goal on one side, and then just pure survival on the other. But for the kids in the punk rock band to sort of acclimate to their new environment, and to step up and to mount some kind of revolt, they have to become killers, and that's brutal. It's not just a high five, let's kill the bad guys. It's, it's, it's holy smokes, we're in far too deep and this is not gonna end well. Um, and sometimes you get a little gratuitous close up if it's a non-fatal wound, there's, but there is... Yeah, one in particular is yeah. coming to mind that yeah. I don't think you could give a high five <laughs> if you had. No, no, it's brutal. But the key is that, that it's, um, it's coupled with an emotional component and there is reverence for all the characters. That's what sets it apart, I hope, is that either even like the, the quote-unquote bad guys, like when there's a life lost, you feel it and it, it, it's, it's, the intensity is real and, and, and the loss 
is real and it's not supposed to. Well, there's a couple of high five moments in the movie. I had to pepper those in just so it's satisfying narratively. <laughs> but um, speaking of the bad guys, your villain is a I've never hated Patrick Stewart more than I did in this film, in a, in a good way. And he was so scary. Um, so what was sort of having him as your villain like on set and just through the whole process? Well, you know, I think when whenever someone that is accomplished as much as as Patrick has, uh, Patrick Stewart has, when Sir Patrick Sir Stewart, Patrick Stewart. <laughs> when when you're on set with someone like that, you're you're really fortunate because. The way that that man conducts himself with everyone is incredibly, I guess, honorable is a good way to put it. Is so much respect for everyone, and it goes without saying. You know, his career on on stage and screen is, is immense, and he's incredibly accomplished. But it's very important to see how human beings that have achieved a lot behave with everyone on set, and that's my biggest takeaway: is is seeing someone that is so respectful, so lovely. Um, and so kind with everyone. And beyond that, uh, I didn't talk to him very much because he was trying to kill me. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's really, it's inspiring. You just want to go out and be like, all right, well, if I ever come anywhere close to, or even half as close to what he's done, I, I just, as a human being, these are lessons that we have to learn along the way. We make movies all together. You know, it doesn't matter, all of us are together in this, sort of shit show trying to make a film and we all have to be respectful to one another and that's like the most important human part of making films I think. <laughs> I mean well, even as an antagonist I feel like he's actually in the beginning at least he's a very sort of respectful and it, it's all it feels sort of transactional and like let's all be calm about this even though yeah. the stakes are terrifying. Um, yeah we're, we're on record as this is Patrick Stewart's most quiet performance on stage or screen in his entire career. Decibel wise or? <laughs> yeah, like literally he's that quiet. And we mic'd him close. And the, the key there was like, he has such presence and authority that he, the one time he does sort of lose his cool and yell at one of his underlings played by Megan Blair, my, my good buddy, um, he does a face palm. You know, it's really violent and impulsive. And he takes a breath and he apologizes and then he carries on. And if, but he, other than that, he doesn't raise his voice. I think it's, it's all like this implied power. And like when he steps on, uh, on scene, he does not have to have monologues or, or do anything that's like trying too hard to be profound. He's just this quiet authority figure, and it's creepy as hell. Maybe I noticed this part of the film in particular just because this is Google and we work at the internet. But I was like, he found the one group that there's a legitimate, like, I believe you when there's a reason for them not being on social media and people not knowing where they are. And like, yeah, we don't post about who we are and where we are, and that kind of hurts them in this scenario. But was that just sort of an added bonus um, as a part of it, or did, was that sort of part no, it, of it? It was one of the things, like, you know, the internet's cool. It's mm -hmm. good. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, how it affected music, how it affected the hardcore scene is terrible. And it's because you no longer have to show up to places, you know? Uh, there's still vibrant scenes and pockets throughout, but like when I was in the hardcore scene in the 1990s, it was all about being there. And you couldn't click on anything, you couldn't stream anything. Um, it was very tactile. And, and that's what I was there for. I was not like a guru with a huge vinyl collection. I can't drop a thousand names, but I remember just being there, it just sort of defined my youth. Um, and the Ain't Rights are this band trying to hold on to that dream and that sort of, and Pat's char the character Pat mentions it, is the texture. Um, so they refuse to go virtual. Um, and talk about you have to show up, you gotta be there, and of course, they pay the price. But now, the twist is, because Green Room is coming out, there's a lot of talk about hardcore again. And A24 has put out this Green Room radio, and yeah, there's like all these gurus talking about the old days, so it's kind of fun where the thesis of my film might be proven wrong. <laughs> Maybe the internet's awesome. You might have awesome negated your again. own thesis of your film. <laughs> because now we're talking about like these hardcore bands from the 80s and 90s that I grew up with, and it's, it's really fun. So you mean your band might go on tour again? You could play the Viper Room again? It's I mean, I, yeah, we might play Viper Room. If we're going to play, we're going to play the Viper Room at midnight. You guys can catch us there any Sunday. This Sunday. <laughs> um, well, sort of speaking of the internet's effect on your career, you, you are someone who definitely sort of has You've built your career, like on your own. It was very 
you know, I, I, I think when you funded Murder Party on your own, and and it's just sort of and Blue Ruin and Blue Ruin. Sorry, um, <laughs> but what do you what do you think of sort of this phenomenon of like how how do you think it would have been different if you were um, sort of become, coming into your own as a filmmaker now when it's like the age of YouTube and you know people are being discovered online or people are self-funding, crowdfunding. Yeah. Um, I used that for Blue Ruin too. I used everything, you know, whatever I could get. But I think um, I felt alone and without access. I tried to make movies, mostly with my high school friends. And Murder Party got distribution, which is a huge coup for an unknown film with unknown filmmakers behind it. Um, and then for Blue Ruin, you know, I, I started to acclimate. I, you know, digital cameras were getting way better. And I, I was using these small DSLR type cameras to make that movie. Um, and it wasn't until promoting that film. I mean, we, we, got, we, we submitted an old fashioned DVD copy to directors Fortnite and Can, and, and that was where everything shifted. We got into that festival, played on, on the world stage, like the, the most prestigious festival in the world. Um, but when we marketed Blue Roo and I saw the power of social media, I, it caught fire on Twitter. It broke you know, the top 10 on iTunes and overall. And just, uh, I'm still on Twitter because of that. So maybe, maybe I'll, I'll retreat later, but I, I'm, I'm loving it. And just being part of this tour right now, like just seeing my film reflected in the eyes of audience members is like what I, what I love. And, you remember why you make films because when you get so close to it over the course of the two years of making it, you kind of can't see it for what it is. And then when people, you just ask them for 94 minutes to come and survive this insane punk rock thriller, and then they do, and you high five, and then you remember why you make them in the first place. <laughs> um, which of the characters do you think each of you is most like in this film? I'm like Reese, obviously. <laughs> I'm so aggro. <laughs> We can tell. Yeah. Could you take it down a couple notches here? I'm trying. Sorry, guys. Really trying. I might just flip this table over. <laughs> I'm, I'm a split between actually Reese and Pat, pretty much. There's actually a real tiger, there's a real Sam, there's a real Tad, based on people. But, but I think I definitely. Pat is the expendable bassist. That's how I felt in the hardcore scene. Ouch. <laughs> no, we we this has been hammered home quite a bit. Yeah. <laughs> over the so you just reminded you that on set. It was like you're yeah. expendable. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 a, and a while ago, I was you know, about 15 pounds heavier with with muscle and worked out, and I was actually amongst my crew the Reese type character. Um, not anymore, but I felt like Pat. Um, but yeah, it, it is a lot of this is based on my experiences and mostly that of my friends. Like I, we had hardcore bands in Virginia. We'd go to DC for shows, but my buddies were the talented musicians. I just yelled into a microphone. Um, and some of their songs, actually his, the fictional band in Green Room plays the songs that I heard in high school written by my buddies. So it's, it's really coming full circle. And this is a way, this whole film is an archive of my youth, like making crazy genre films and being in punk rock bands and, and hardcore uh, shows and just like, it's a way to archive that because I look so soft and lame. I want just a little bit of street cred and green room. I hope gives me a little bit. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so what's what's? I think my last question is: What's something you hope people take away from this film? The elation of surviving a purely like physical experience. That, that's you know, it's it's fiction and it's two dimensional on a screen. But I want. The, the experience to be real, and so far so good. It's really, um, there's, if you watch it a second or third time, there's all kinds of layers of political commentary, and you can go on about the intellectual nature of this movie, but I want that visceral experience, and I think it's what's lacking in cinema. Even the, we, we get to big spectacle, and we can explode worlds, and I don't really feel much. And Green Room is this hyper intense, intimate action movie that, is grounded not only by the authenticity, and it has its fair share of violence and mayhem, but it's the actors, it's the performances that makes it, it, it drives home the reality and, and that, that terrifying intensity that you feel like you are with the band and the rug has been pulled out from under you and you have no idea where it's gonna go. I mean, I, I feel like that's the director's statement right there, so I don't really know what I can add to that. Well, what do you want them to take away? Just how sick I am at playing bass. Yeah. 
There you go. But don't forget that you're expendable, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> but expendable. <laughs> but expendable. Thank you both so much for joining us today. And Our pleasure. Go see Green Room. <laughs> Thank you.